And with that, I will hand things over to Sophie. Hi everyone, I'm Sophie. I'm a board member for the RPA and I'm very excited to introduce Chris Graham. Chris is a field botanist with Hudsonia, a nonprofit environmental research institute based in Dutchess County. His background is in plant community ecology. His master's degree research investigated the effects of large herbivore extirpation on seed survival and woody seedling communities in tropical forest fragments with implications for future canopy tree community composition. At Hudsonia, Chris works on habitat mapping projects and on floristic surveys. He's interested in rare species conservation, community description and classification, and the effects of resource extraction and global change on plant communities, among many other topics. So with that, I will hand it off to Chris. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Sophie, and thank you, Dan, and uh, I'm happy, happy to be here. Uh, I'm going to turn off my, if I can, my video right now, I, so you'll just see a stock photo of me, and then I'll, whoops, I'll turn it back on at, at the end when we do the Q&A. Okay, um, so um, this is Wildflowers of the Plateau and Beyond. Um, the beyond is important because I'm no expert in Rensselaer Plateau ecology. Um, I live in the mid Hudson Valley and a lot of our work that I, that I do for Hudsonia is in the mid and lower Hudson Valley. That said, I have, um, I have hiked on the plateau a few times, including uh, one day of, the, of your annual plateau traverse a few years ago. And I've been to the Adirondacks plenty of times and um, other cooler, cooler environments like the Catskills. And I, I'm relying heavily on knowledge um, that I've got, that I've obtained from some of your local experts like um, David Hunt and um, Tom Phillips, who are, I think you're two of your botanical gurus on the plateau. Um, and anything I can't tell you, especially about uh, places to find certain flowers or habitats to find them in, uh, one of those two could tell you, at, uh, and I'm sure a lot of RPAs folks can tell you uh, and give you a lot of tips as well about where to find different species. So, uh, let's see. Hmm. Sorry, having problems with my arrow keys not working, but hopefully they'll work now. Um, so I do work for Hudsonia. Um, we are a small nonprofit institute. Uh, we do a lot of habitat mapping, biodiversity surveys, and a lot of biodiversity education, uh, especially working with uh, town planning boards, conservation advisory councils, and other town bodies to understand the local, the biodiversity and habitats that they have in their munis municipalities. Um, we often provide them with habitat mapping of their towns and we'll work with them to um, try to teach them how to use that information when they're reviewing development proposals or doing open space planning. We put out a, usually a twice yearly publication called News from Hudsonia. Uh, which you can view online at the second link there, the publications link. This is our general website in the top. And if you want to be added to the paper, the hard copy list, because we do still send out hard copies, you could always email me here. If you look uh, like what you see online and want to get uh, hard copies, we send them out for free. And there's uh, one of our recent issues. So um, I'll get right into it. Ooh, this bar at the top, let me just move that. Um, okay, so um, I'll be dealing may, mostly with spring wildflowers since that is the season we're coming up upon. Well, I'll, I'll get to uh, hopefully, if, if we don't run out of time, a few summer things at the end. Uh, and I'll try to go roughly in chronological order. So. The earliest um, 
native wildflower that um, you are going to see or that you can see in our region is skunk cabbage. And it is a wildflower, even though it's not showy in a traditional sense. Here's a swamp with a carpet of, uh, of skunk, skunk cabbage. I'm sure most of you are familiar with this site. Hmm. Does anyone, okay, sorry. Continuing technical problems. Um, here's a, uh, a newly emerging reproductive structure of a skunk cabbage. These will come up as early as February down here, probably not quite so early up there, but they come up awfully early. They can even poke through the snow. They create their own metabolic heat. And so that helps melt snow and volatilize chemicals that attract early flying pollinators. Now, uh, skunk cabbage consists, the reproductive structure consists of an outer sheath, which is called a spathe, and an inner structure called a spadix. This is characteristic of all plants in this family, which also includes Jack in the pulpit, which we'll see later. It's a mostly tropical family, but we do have a few individuals in the temperate zone. So here is a spathe that's been pulled open. They're usually, um, they're usually wrapped fairly tightly. And you can see the, the spadix with individual flower structures. It's a club-shaped structure. Here's a close-up view of a, of a spadix with the male flowering parts here, the stamens, which produce pollen. You can see pollen dusted across the surface. And these maroon, dark maroon structures are what passes for petals on a skunk cabbage. They can uh, vary from maroon to cream colored or even, or even whitish. So lots of minute flowers. Here's a closer up view of one of the rosettes of large leaves, which come up after the flowering structures. And here's a fruit. Now these are pollinated by a really early flying um, flies and even honeybees. Um, and they don't set a lot of fruit from what I've read because there aren't a lot of insects flying that early in the season. And interestingly, these are unpalatable to most herbivores, but evidently um, black bear can rely very heavily upon eating the foliage when they first emerge from hibernation. A large part of their diet when they first come out can be skunk cabbage, especially if there are no acorns left from the previous year. So bloodroot, bloodroot is one of several species that I'm going to touch on that is uh, found mostly in very rich uh, soils. That is soils that are rich in calcium uh, that you might get over limestone or marble. And so it's rare on the plateau because you don't have a lot of calcareous soils, I've been told. But it is present on the uh, escarpment. This is the, the outer edge of the plateau. Uh, so I've been told. Um, and so you could see it there. You can also see it elsewhere in Rensselaer, in Rensselaer County. Um, a few good places I've been told to see uh, some of these, these early spring ephemerals that like calcareous soils are the Rensselaer Tech Park uh, in Rensselaer County and the Madison Hollow Trail in the Taconics, probably some of the other trails going up the, the uh, Taconic Escarpment. Um, yeah, so bloodroot is, is another one of our very early flowering plants. Its flowers fully emerge before the leaves even unfurl. You can see here's a leaf still furled around the flower. Uh, it has eight to 12 petals and large, golden showy stamens and the contrast between the white and yellow attracts its pollinators, which um, again are early flying flies and bees. Uh, the flies will pollinate when it's below 55 degrees Fahrenheit because they can fly at lower temperatures than the bees. 
Um, let's see. And it is dispersed by ants. Quite a few of our spring wildflowers are dispersed by ants because the seeds are attached to oil-rich bodies called eleasomes, uh, which are very valuable to as a food for ants. And so they will collect the seeds, take them back to their nests, eat the eleasomes, and discard the seeds. And so it disperses this plant farther away from the parent plant than would otherwise be possible. Now, after the flowers, so the flowers will close up during when it's overcast, which is what's happening here, I believe. Eventually, the leaves do emerge, uh, fully unfurl. And by this point, usually the flowers are wilting. And they continue to grow into the summer and can get quite large. And they have this really unique shape, kind of a almost a liver-shaped leaf with these many deep lobes. One of my favorite leaves. Uh, here's an illustration from an old book, which I found online from the mid 1800s. Um, okay, here's another one of these rich forest herbs. Um, this is Dutchman's breeches. It uh, grows on in calcareous woods and on outcrops, uh, five to nine inches high. It is also in the poppy family, but a different section of the poppy family with uh, pretty different characteristics. The flowers here, instead of being uh, circular with a regular arrangement of petals are quite irregular. They're, in fact, you might say, pantaloon shaped, and, and that's why this is called Dutchman's breeches. They have four petals. This includes two longer outer petals with these long nectar containing spurs, and then two short inner petals, which are mostly, which remain closed. And then a yellow tip on the whole flower, which helps attract pollinators. It has these beautiful finely dissected leaves. The main pollinator for this is queen bumblebees, whose long proboscis allows them to reach deep into these spurs. Again, these are ant dispersed because they have these oil rich bodies attached to the seeds. Here is a close relative squirrel corn, which I'm not sure if you, uh, it's even present on, in Rensselaer County. Uh, Dutchman's breeches is, uh, I've been told, um, on the escarpment. Um, squirrel corn is so called because it has little yellow um, bulbs that resemble corn, corn kernels underground, of course. So here's another very early spring wildflower. This, in fact, may be the first showy wildflower to emerge in most places. And this one doesn't require especially calcareous soils. Um, just open, open woods. Uh, it should be fairly common on the plateau. This is round-lobed round -lobed hepatica. Uh, it's a low plant. Um, it has small flowers. Uh, well, not tiny, but fairly small, one and a half to one inch wide, or sorry, half inch to an inch wide, with between five and 12 petals, usually around six petals though. Uh, it's in the buttercup family, which quite a few of this early spring flowers and spring ephemeral flowers are. Um, buttercups have, they're characterized by their many stamens, which are their male parts, and then the many pistils in the center, which are the female parts, and a variable number of petals. Um, now, something interesting about the hepaticas are that they have evergreen leaves. Um, their leaves will overwinter and persist into the following spring and, until the flowers pop up. This, these evergreen leaves is partly what allows them to flower so early. They can photosynthesize as soon as there's good, any good spring sunlight. Their leaves are already there and waiting. And then at some point after the flowers emerge, 
Um, and as new fresh leaves come, come in, these previous year's leaves will wilt away. Um, let's see. They also have long silky hairs on the flower stalks, which is kind of hard to see here. And that helps keep these flowers warm early in the spring. So um, you, I'm sure most of you have seen trout lilies, another one of our common very early spring ephemerals. These um, are in moist woods. They can be abundant in your beech maple forests. Um, the flowers are, are an inch to an inch and a half long. They generally, they have two leaves per plant and the leaves, oops, thought I had another picture there. The leaves are mottled pink and green uh, and sort of resemble a trout and, and hence the name trout lily. Like many of our spring flowers, they close at night and on overcast days, but then will reopen. They're pollinated by native bees, honeybees, uh, bee flies, and certain beetles. And their seeds, once again, are ant dispersed. Um, and you can see the leaves are quite variable. The, the red modeling can be quite faint or it can be, it can be darker. So look for these really um, easy to spot leaves coming up in the spring and along with, along with the showy flowers. I'm afraid I don't have, I'm realizing I don't have a clock in front of me at all. Uh, Dan, maybe you could give me a, a warning around mm, 7.40 or 7.45? Yeah, sure thing. Okay, because I have no idea what, what time it is. <laughs> um, all right, so spring beauties, uh, another of our early flowering, early spring, spring ephemerals. Um, the, uh, these, like, like many of our spring ephemerals, they come and go within a matter of, uh, of weeks, um, flowers, leaves, and all. After they're done flowering, um, within a couple of weeks of flowering, the leaves will wilt away and, and be gone, and there will be no evidence of these in the forest by early to mid-June. So a lot of the, uh, quite a few of the flowers that we're seeing are like that. Um, Dutchman's breeches and trout lily are the same. <clears throat> um, so you have two species of spring beauty, uh, Claytonia virginica, which is narrow leaf spring beauty. And you can see here the narrow, a narrow leaf. And then Claytonia caroliniana, Carolina spring beauty, which has these much wider and shorter leaves. You can see not so well here. And then you can see in this picture, these wider leaves. These narrow ones are really long and strap-like. <clears throat> and so they're pretty easy to tell apart. Now, um, the wide-leaved, sorry, the narrow-leaved spring beauty is county rare for Rensselaer Plateau, according to your um, RPA's conservation plan document. Um, these are lo uh, low plants with small flowers of maybe a half inch across. Um, petals that vary from mostly white to quite having quite dark pink stripes, which um, we call nectar guides because they will help along with the yellow centers will help guide pollinators to the good stuff in the center of the, the flowers. That is the, the nectar. Um, and these are pollinated by small native bees and flies, and again, are ant dispersed. So you'll hear that over and over again. Many of these spring ephemerals are ant dispersed. Uh, these you'll find in woods and fields. Um, the rare one, the Virginia uh, spring beauty, is more associated with rich rich, deep soil woods. And so that's probably why it's so rare in Rensselaer County. And here's a close-up shot. You can see these really delightful pink stamens that really probably help to attract pollinators. Um, 
Okay, so this is one I'm not going to spend much time on because uh, it's apparently rare on the plateau, but it, uh, it could occur on the escarpment. It likes calcium rich, rocky places. This is early saxifrage of the saxifrage family. Um, a quite pretty flower with five, five white petals. Uh, it gets tall and spindly, it flowers. It's not, I wouldn't, it's, it's definitely not a classic ephemeral. Its leaves will stay around for most of the summer and it, it'll continue to flower into June and the stems will elongate and thicken as it, as it um, develops and continues to flower into the summer. But it does appear pretty early in, fairly early in the spring. And here's a close up of those beautiful flowers. So um, this is, it's another one of my favorites that I, I had to include, even though it does prefer these calcium rich forests. This is blue cohosh, which is in the barberry family. Uh, you wouldn't know it to look at it. This is the family of Japanese barberry, a common invasive shrub. It grows to be one to three feet tall. So it's a, a bigger stature plant than a lot of the species we've been looking at so far. It has these pretty, fairly, fairly large compound leaves. This is one leaf here with multiple sort of mitten shaped leaflets if, if your mittens only had three fingers or, or three thumbs perhaps because they're quite wide. Um, this I've been told grows mostly on the escarpment but there are a couple locations for it on the central plateau. So um, look out for those. Now the flowers are around, an, around a half inch wide and they have these, um, looks like six yellow sepals. These are actually not petals, they're, they're sepals. And then the petals are highly reduced. They're hard to see here, but they're these thickened areas at the base of the sepals. And then when it fruits from midsummer all the way into the fall, it gets these blue berry-like fruits, um, except, and that's why it's called blue cohosh, except just kidding, these, these actually aren't fruits, they're just seeds. Um, apparently the seeds grow so fast that they burst the ovary uh, early on in the process. And then the ovary withers away and falls off and you hardly ever, ever see it. And so what you are seeing um, is actually blue, seeds with a very thin blue seed coat. Um, it's been called the only gymnospermous um, angiosperm, meaning, the only flowering plant without a fruit, uh, even though that's not true. It, it does have a fruit. It just bursts and falls off really, really early. So here's a fun one, wild ginger. Um, again, it likes rich woods and it produces two leaves, two heart-shaped leaves um, per plant. Uh, looks like it can have three sometimes because here's one with three and a single flower from the base of the plant that comes out along the ground here, rests on the, rests on the ground, and is, is quite pretty when you look at it. It's often buried in leaf litter, so you, some, you often have to dig for it to even find it. It has these white, hairy outer petals and hairy leaf stalks, as you can see. What pollinates it actually is not completely known. Uh, it may be mostly self-pollinated. It used to be thought that flies pollinated it, but it really hasn't been observed and it doesn't produce the foul odors that most fly pollinated plants have. Again, it has ant dispersed seeds. And here's a white flower. They can vary in their color. Ah, and here's another, another neat illustration from that old book. The rhizomes, which are thickened, thick underground stems, uh, horizontal underground stems, um, traditionally have been thought to be edible. They've been candied and eaten, but they actually contain uh, aristolochic acid, which if eaten in large quantities is carcinogenic. So um, it's not recommended to eat. You can make a tea out of it just by boiling the rhizomes. And since you're not actually eating the rhizomes, 
you don't get um, or hardly get any of the, <laughs> the aristolochic acid. And so that's said to be safe to drink in small quantities. So I wouldn't recommend it because, especially on the plateau, because this is a rare, a rare flower for you guys. So don't go digging this up to get the rhizomes. Um, all right, this is a two-leaved toothwort. It's one of our spring flowering mustards. Now mustards, the entire family, pretty, I'd say very reliably is characterized by flowers with four petals, often in a cross shape, which um, most flowering plant families don't have. There are a couple other families, but four petals is an, un is an unusual number. This grows in uh, moist woods with deep, rich soils and stream banks. Um, it is on the plat central plateau, though fairly uncommon. Um, so I won't spend much time on it, but just wanted to point out that we have some beautiful spring flowering ephemeral mustards, which, you know, I would, I, I wouldn't have, before I, be, you know, got into botany, I wouldn't have thought of mustards as being spring ephemerals. <clears throat> All right, so this is dwarf ginseng, which is not, not uncommon on the central plateau. It grows in moist woods uh, along swamp edges and along stream banks. It likes, it likes moisture and a canopy. It's related to the more common ginseng, which is uh, fairly rare these days. Um, <clears throat> this one is uh, sort of a diminutive, uh, form though. It's, it's three to eight inches tall, usually on the smaller end of that, with small flowers in arranged in umbels. Um, an umbel is a flower cluster in which all the flower stalks come off of a single point. Think of Queen Anne's lace. Uh, each of these flowers has five white petals, as you can see, and each plant has three three leaves whirled along the bottom. And these leaves, but maybe I had a close up. These leaves have five, usually five leaflets arranged in a palm shape, uh, much like common ginseng, but mu much smaller. So um, this should be another common spring ephemeral for you, for you guys. Uh, this, this will flower in late April to May. Um, in open woods, doesn't need anything special, open deciduous woods, uh, four, four, to nine, four to nine inches tall with flowers of around three quarters to, to an inch uh, wide. So fairly large showy flowers with five to 10 petals and many, many uh, stamens and pistils. And this is another member of the buttercup, buttercup family. <clears throat> with its many, many showy stamens. Now the leaves are interesting. They come off in a whorl right below the flower cluster. And they're again, kind of deformed, mitten shaped. And then at the base of the flower, there will be more leaves on long, long stalks. And I don't have a, a picture showing those. All right, so this is one of my favorites, miterwort or bishop's cap. Mitella diphylla. Uh, it's in the saxifrage family, um, which, let's see, we already had, oh, the micranthes, the saxifrage is, is in the same family. This is another one that likes rich forest soils, calcareous soils. Uh, it is on the escarpment. It's taller than a lot of these small spring ephemerals, can be a foot or more tall. Um, it has a pair of leaves on each stem, hence the name diphy diphyla. These kind of maple-shaped leaves, um, a pair of opposite maple-shaped leaves is very characteristic of it. And uh, my favorite part of it is the, the uh, beautiful snowflake-shaped petals, which, is, which are like nothing else that we have around here. Now I've often wondered why it was called, well, I should say here's a, here's a stalk 
um, with fruit. It's in the fruiting stage and it has these kind of little cups of black fruits. So I've often wondered why, uh, why it's called miterwort. It turns out <clears throat> my, both miterwort and bishop's cap come from the same thing. These, stall, these little cups of fruits, these lentil shaped fruits um, are thought by some to resemble a bishop's cap. Uh, another name for a bishop's cap is a, a miter. Uh, personally, I think they look more like uh, a bird's nest fungus, which you might have seen in your um, in some bear garden soils around around your place. So I thought that was kind of unique, kind of a convergence of vascular plants and and fungus here, not related at all, of course, to each other. Um, so. <laughs> Uh, getting into a bit later spring here, this is, I'd say, a solidly May blooming plant. We have the bane berries, two, uh, two species in the Northeast, um, both in the genus Actea and both in the buttercup family. Uh, now, these are, are large, fairly large forest herbs. They can be between one and three feet tall. They have enormous uh, or at least their leaves can be enormous, compound leaves. This is a single, is a single leaf. Um, it's multiple times compound, meaning, well, uh, you have multiple divisions. It's divided here into one section, and then that section is divided into more sections, and so on and so forth. It's almost like a fractal. Um, it has showy, um, long flower clusters with lots of little white flowers that are almost like sp little spray. Each flower is a, almost a little spray of white showy stamens, which again are the male parts. And each flower also has four to 10 narrow petals, which are, all, which are kind of overwhelmed by the, the stamens. What you're seeing here is all stamens. Um, let's see, here's a petal right here. Now the red and white baneberry or doll's eyes is another name for it. They're difficult to tell apart by the flowers, but it, but it can be done. I'd say impossible to tell apart when you only have leaves. The easiest stage to tell them apart at is when they're fruiting. Uh, on the left is an immature flower, uh, fruit cluster from a white baneberry. Uh, or doll's eyes. And then here's the red bean berry, obviously. Now, another feature is that these have much thicker uh, stalks to the fruits, and, and these are much more delicate. <clears throat> another difference between the two. And then here's a mature, a fully mature fruiting cluster for the white bean berry. Um, these fruits are. Um, well, the flowers are chiefly pollinated by a European weevil, according to one study. Um, but of course, there are, there are native pollinators, uh, mainly some native beetles and solitary bees. And they're dispersed by birds and small mammals, though, uh, which eat the fruits, though the fruits are quite poisonous to people. All right, here's a, um, a very showy and common wetland spring ephemeral. Marsh marigold, um, probably familiar from swamps and wet meadows of the region, grows to be one to two feet tall and flowers in late April and May. The flowers are, are um, <clears throat> well, I should say the leaves are pretty, uh, pretty heart shaped um, on long, long stalks or petioles. And the flowers are large and showy, and again, um, they're in the buttercup family with all of these showy stamens and numerous pistils in the middle. So definitely getting, you're probably starting to see a, a pattern here. A lot of our spring flowers are in the buttercup family. That's fine, because they're quite beautiful. All right, um, so here's this one of our other plants in the arum family. 
the mostly tropical family that includes skunk cabbage. Uh, this is Jack in the pulpit. It grows, it's gonna flower in May and maybe even into early June. It grows in moist woods and swamps. Um, it reaches one to th heights of one to three feet and has one to two uh, long stalked compound leaves per plant. And each of these compound leaves has three leaflets. Like the um, skunk cabbage, it has this unique flower structure um, with a spathe surrounding a spadix. Um, here's a real life version of it. This club-like uh, spadix and really showy purple and green striped spathe. And then here's one with mature fruits. It gets these dense clusters of large, brightly colored berries, which, <laughs> which I love this, are dispersed by box turtles. Box turtle this is apparently the favorite food of box turtles. Um, it may be eaten by birds and mammals as well. And it's been found that fruits that go through a box turtle's digestive system have a much, the seeds rather, that come out of a box turtle have a much higher germination rate than ones that haven't been eaten by a box turtle. Um, Chris, it's about 7.40 now. Wow, okay. Um, so we're still I'll doing fine go... on time. I'm sorry? We're still doing fine on time. Okay, could you tell me when it's about five of and then I'll, I'll go to about eight? Absolutely. Great. Um, so, uh, Jack in the pulpit, you don't usually see this, but um, someone was nice enough or mean enough, uh, <laughs> as it were, to, um, to pull, to cut away the part of the spathe here and show us uh, a bunch of the female flowers on a Jack in the pulpit. They don't have uh, petals or, or anything fancy. They just have a stigma, which is the showy uh, surface that, sticky surface that receives pollen. Now, what's interesting about Jack in the pulpit is that its flower, its plants are um, dioecious, meaning any given plant only has female or male flowers, um, with some rare exceptions. A small percentage of them will have some of, some of both sexes. And even be even better, I think, is that it can it's been found that it can switch sexes from year to year. Um, it's a perennial plant. And when it comes up from year to year, it can be male one year and female the next year. And it's thought that this is related to how well the plant's doing and how much uh, it's been able to photosynthesize because it costs a lot more carbohydrates or sugars to produce the female flowers and the fruits than it does the males. The males are much less resource intensive. Um, so yeah, if there's a bad year, a female plant may revert back to male. Um, also the number of leaves often corresponds with the sex. So female plants will be more robust with two leaves and male plants often will be smaller with only one leaf because they're they're either young and flowering for the first time or they've had a bad year. Um, so these are pollinated by mostly gnats and thrips, it's thought. And the base of the male, the spathe in the male plants has a little hole. So these insects, they will fly in. They can't crawl out because it's too slippery. They often can't find their way out flying but they can escape after covering themselves in pollen, they can escape through this little hole. The female spathes, the spathes of the female plants have, have no hole. And so those insects get in there, they pollinate, hopefully pollinate the flowers and they can't escape. And so it's thought to be a strategy to trap those insects in there longer until they are able to pollinate the flowers. Um, now, okay, I'm not going to get much into this um, since I have a lot of plants left, but um, some people like to split 
our traditional jack in the jack in the pulp into three uh, distinct species. And currently, the official keepers of the New York flora are are doing this. They're splitting it up into three species rather than three subspecies. So, uh, in on the plateau, you would only have two of those. Uh, a third species is more in southern New York, but you could have either traditional jack in the pulpit or swamp jack in the pulpit. Um, although, confusingly, the traditional one can also grow in swamps. So you can't just go by the habitat. Uh, some key differences are the swamp jack in the pulpit has these very pronounced fluted ridges to the spathe, whereas the spathe here is just smooth, unfluted. And also the sheath has this wide opening here whereas this one is usually overlapping. And then there are a few other differences, kind of subtle differences to look at. So just be aware, keep an eye out for this fluting um, when you're in a swamp and you see a, a jack in the pulpit. All right, so uh, I've been told that this is the most common violet on the plateau, round-leaved violet. It has these, <clears throat> uh, whew, um, broad egg-shaped to rounded leaves that often lie flat, uh, lie flat on the ground. This is the earliest blooming uh, native violet in the Northeast. Um, it can flower uh, pretty early in the season. <clears throat> These showy bright yellow um, petals with dark purple nectar guides. It grows in cool, uh, cool, rich forests, um, especially on higher floodplain terraces and also on the edge, edges of paths. Um, <clears throat> let's see. And yeah. So another violet you might have is the marsh blue violet, which grows in marshes and swamps and seeps and other wet places. Um, if you see a wetland, a purple wetland violet, uh, odds are on the plateau, odds are that it's, that it's this marsh blue violet. Um, now violets in general are pollinated, uh, the main pollinators of them are butterflies. <clears throat> and they do have uh, spurs. Let's see if we can see a spur. Mm. I'm afraid I don't have any shots of the spurs, but in the back there is a spur, a nectar spur that draws in the pollinators. Uh, and here's smooth white violet. This is a another, uh, this is a tiny white violet with very small leaves, often rounded at the tip. And it grows along stream banks and spring seeps and in often in peat mosses in, in wetlands. Uh, all right, great. I'm glad we'll have time for the trillions. Um, so you could have uh, probably three trillions um, on, the, on the plateau. Um, the most common would probably be purple trillium, trillium erectum which um, has, a, has a bunch of really fascinating common names, I think. It's also called Stinking Benjamin because uh, apparently the flowers produce a sort of fet fetid odor that attracts some of their pollinators, um, like uh, flies and carrion beetles. Um, it, it's also pollinated by native bees. Another name is uh, birthwort. Um, owing to traditional medicinal uses. And it can uh, also be called wake robin um, because back when robins, uh, all robins migrated, I don't know if any of your robins stick around on the plateau or since it's colder up there, but down here, most of the robins stick around all winter, but I guess a hundred years ago and, and more, they all flew south. And so, this usually was flowering right around the time when robins returned north, hence the name uh, wake robin. So the trilliums all flower uh, in May, 
I would say. Um, this, this one grows in moist, cool woods. Um, let's see, uh, they're all three trilliums are between six and 20 inches high. They all have parts in threes, three showy large petals, three sepals, three, lar three large leaves in a single whorl. <clears throat> Um, and they're just one of the, the most attractive flowers you'll, you'll see in the spring or spring woodlands. Uh, this is painted, painted trillium, which um, is also common at higher elevations on the plateau. It, it needs cool, moist, acidic woods. It has these white pe petals that are painted with these brilliant magenta uh, chevrons at the center. Um, it has the three leaves. Unlike the other two species, these have short leaf stalks or petioles. So if you only have leaves, you can still tell them apart because these have these short leaf stalks. Um, you can see here fruit starting to form. These will get um, bright red, at least the purple trillium will get bright red fruits. I, I forget what color these are when they're mature. Um, and then here is, uh, this would be your most uncommon white tr uh, trillium if, uh, if you have it. It's possibly on the escarpment. It needs calcareous rich soils. Um, white, this is white trillium or large, or large flowered trillium. <clears throat> and it has these sort of funnel shaped, these flowers, its petals form sort of a funnel shape. Now all the trillium seeds are dispersed by ants because they have these oil rich bodies, but also it's been found that um, wasps and daddy long legs will disperse the seeds uh, because they also will eat the oil rich bodies. And even deer and birds are thought to, to be able to disperse the seeds by, by consuming the large fleshy fruits. And later, at a later stage, when it's a bit older, the flowers will, these white trillium flowers will become a dark pink. It's not a different species, it's just a later stage of the white trillium. Um, so getting into the lilies and lily-like plants, <clears throat> uh, blue bead lily is common in some of the cooler habitats on the plateau, like your spruce fir forests. It needs moist, cool woods. It's everywhere in the Adirondacks. Uh, it flowers in uh, spring to early summer. It has these large, ro these rosettes of uh, two to four large oval shaped leaves. And it puts up this flowering, this long flowering stalk um, with uh, numerous showy yellowish green flowers. Each flower um, has six petal-like structures. Now in the lily family, you will often get six petal-like structures and no one knows which are the sepals and which are the petals. And so people just call them tepals. That's quite common in, in the lily family. <clears throat> and then six stamens. Most things in the lily families, most plants have parts in multiples of threes. That's very characteristic of the lily family. Let's see. And then it's called blue bee lily because of these bead-like berries that it, that it develops later in the summer. <clears throat> All right, um, rosy twisted stalk is also in the lily family. You'll find this in woods and in clearings. According to David Hunt, it is characteristic of the central plateau, but uncommon. Um, so uh, try and find it. It's, it's a beautiful plant. Um, <clears throat> it, it looks a lot like Solomon's seal, which we will see soon. But unlike Solomon's seal, seal it branches or forks. Um, like Solomon's seal, it has flowers. Here you can see the flowers kind of hiding in the back here. Like Solomon's seal, it has flowers that droop down beneath it. 
These are bell shaped, uh, long, showy uh, pink flowers that um, produce a triangular, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the wrong notes here. Um, ah, and it's called twisted stalk because it has, you can't see it here, but the stalks are often bent or twisted. That's the name, twisted stalk. And there's a close up. Chris, it's about okay. five of eight now. Wow, okay. It um, develops these really plump, red, bright red berries. All right, I'm gonna skip bellworts. All right, uh, Harry Solomon seal. Um, is probably common on the plateau. It's another late spring bloomer. It has these arching nodding stems with numerous large leaves in two rows or ranks. And like, and here's a, here's a version, a view of it from above. It grows in deciduous woods and on outcrops. Skip that. Like the twisted stalk, it has this row of, of dangling flowers, delicate dangling greenish flowers with six petal-like structures. And it gets blueberry, blueberries as it's blueberries, although don't, don't eat them, they're not blueberries. Um, <clears throat> All right, and false Solomon seal is quite similar to true Solomon seal. Um, it, you can tell it apart based on the leaves. They have a coarser texture, but it's easily confused. Uh, the dead giveaway is that instead of the drooping single flowers, it has a long dense flower cluster at the end of the stalk, at the end of the stem. And it has, again, these beautiful showy, flowers with uh, no petals, just a bunch of stamens. And here are the fruits. Um, these will become uh, bright red when they're fully mature. Let's see, let's do one more. I've been told that this is the most common wetland wildflower on the plateau. This is foam flower. Uh, it's the same family as the mitre wart. <clears throat> it, uh, you'll find it in hemlock northern hardwood forests and also hemlock hardwood swamps. So it needs moist, cool environments. It can form dense carpets in the swamps on the plateau. It has numerous flowers on a long, on a elongate cluster. Uh, you can see this one's still developing and this is fully developed. And these uh, uh, maple shaped leaves, just like the um, miter wort, common feature of that, of that family. And six, six white petals. And it's hard to tell here, but it will have a, a basal rosette um, of, of these maple shaped leaves that are heart shaped at the base. So I'll, I'll end it there. And um, be glad to take any questions. Oh, actually, let me skip ahead here to my uh, acknowledgments and thank you slide here. So I'd like to thank um, RPA, of course, for, for inviting me uh, to do this talk. Uh, Tom Phillips usually does it, but he wasn't able to do it this year. So I'm glad to fill in. Um, uh, thank you to Dan Morse and Sophie uh, for hosting and introducing me. Thank you to Annie Jacobs for first inviting me and giving me some advice on places to find flowers. And thank you to your um, two local uh, expert botanists, David Hunt and Tom Phillips. Um, if you'd like more information on plants in New York in general, you can check out the New York Flora Atlas. There's also a really great group called the New York Flora Association, which does a lot of stuff, uh, but the funnest things they do are field trips and workshops throughout the growing season. Um, I'll be leading a couple of field trips this year for them, and anyone is invited, no matter what, you're, um, what level you're at, 
even if you've never looked at a plant before. Um, uh, Go Botany is a great website uh, by the Native Plant Trust, which used to be the New England Wildflower Society, with uh, great photos for almost every species and keys for keying things out. Um, and then <clears throat> I was helped a lot getting information from the Rensselaer Plateau Regional Conservation Plan, um, especially this table that shows your regional, regionally rare plants. And so you can find that here. And you're, I'm sure most of you already know this, <laughs> preaching, to, preaching to the choir, but all of your great ecological community maps are here. And that's it. I'll take any questions. Thanks so much, Chris. So first question I have from the chat is if you can talk about how the ephemerals take advantage of the open canopy in early spring. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, I didn't, I meant to mention that, but yeah, a lot of these, all these spring ephemerals are leafing out and flowering super early um, and they're leafing out so early so that their leaves can take advantage of the leafless canopy and do most of their photosynthesis for the year in just a few weeks. And uh, most of them are perennials, if not all of the all ones I discussed. And so they use this time to build up carbohydrates and sugars, uh, i.e. food, and we'll store those underground in rhizomes or tubers or corms or, or bulbs for later for later use. So that's that's why they, they come out so early in the spring. Great. So the next question is if you could comment on the overpopulation of deer on the diversity mm. of native flowering plants on the plateau in particular. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I can comment on it. Um, you might not like my comment, <laughs> my comments, but it, um, yeah, it's a really big problem in the Hudson Valley. Um, I gather it's a big problem in on the plateau from that from that question. Central New York, I've heard it's a huge problem. Western New York, basically all the, the entire Northeast, it's a huge problem. Uh, the deer are overpopulated and they eat. A lot of our forest uh, forbs and and herbs and woody woody plant seedlings and so um, they've really uh, dramatically changed our forest understories in the last few decades and uh, there's a variety of factors for why they're so overpopulated and unfortunately um, uh, from what I've been able to read and 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 hear um, there's not there's nothing we can do about it, really, <laughs> and, unless, except on a very small scale. If you have uh, a population of a rare plant, you can fence it off. If you have a small preserve or even a larger preserve, there are some eff efforts underway to do deer hunting and deer calling in different places um, to try to, to reduce deer populations. This has to be done perpetually because as soon as it stopped, deer will flood in from the surrounding forest, surrounding areas, and you'll have the same problem all over again. And uh, I'm not sure if there are definitive results of how effective it is. Um, there might be, I just haven't delved into the, into the research. So I'm not sure if it's how, how effective that is. And it's certainly very costly and um, laborious and a lot of people do not like to to kill to kill deer, and, and that's a that's a very valid point too. I mean, you have to consider that aspect of it as well. So, <clears throat> well, along with that, there are a lot of people wondering what your thoughts are on Asian jumping worm and their impact. Mm. Um, I think that it's a really big emerging problem. Uh, again, I. I I've, I've only um, read about it a little bit, so no, I'm not an expert. Um, it sounds like it could be these the Asian jumping worms are a lot more uh, can be a lot more prolific than the European or usual European invasive worms, and so can have a lot more, even more damaging 
ecological effects. And so it's another reason uh, I'll use this <laughs> as a chance to get up on my soapbox. It's, it's another good reason to not, um, to try to not fragment forests by building really long driveways deep into the middle of forests um, with houses and lawns and gardens and Asian jumping worms, uh, as well as many other, uh, and many other problems like nest, songbird nest predators. So, so yeah, um, I don't know if there's a lot, I'm not sure if there's much we can do about it. Again, I haven't, I haven't done a lot of reading about it, except just try to keep, um, people uh, landscaping um, and, and people out of deeper core forest areas. <clears throat> Another question from the chat. Is there any way to propagate and encourage more growth on one's property for many of the plants you mentioned? Hmm. Um, hmm. Well, I mean, I could, I could speculate. I'm, I'm really not a um, horticultural person at all. So um, I think all I can say to, to that is uh, find the right habitats on your property, you know, learn, learn about the species and whether it needs a, a drier or wetter habitat. Um, you could probably put some lime down in your soils if you wanted to grow some of these species that love calcareous conditions. Um, you can buy, there are good sources for native, native uh, seeds and native seedlings out there, but um, make sure you find a reputable source um, and make sure that they're uh, sorry, uh, greenhouse, uh, Propagated, not just greenhouse grown. If something is just greenhouse grown, it can can still be harvested in the wild and then grown in the greenhouse. You want to make sure it's propagated from seed from a greenhouse population. Um, <clears throat> and again, I don't, I don't know if there's any official certification for this stuff. You just have to um, judge your sources and try to find one that seems uh, reputable. So, yeah. I wish I could say more. I wish I knew more about the horticultural aspect of it. Are there any lady slippers mm. or trailing arbutus on the plateau that you know of? Um, yeah, so there are, there should be pink lady slippers up there. Yes, there are. Okay. There are, great. Uh, let me uh, go to my lady slipper slide quickly, which I didn't get to. Um, beautiful showy uh, flower, also called a moccasin flower for uh, uh, obvious reasons, with this really inflated sac-like lip. Uh, the lower petal of an orchid is called a lip. Um, bees will enter through this slit, <clears throat> and then not be able to get back out the slit. So they emerge. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm not sharing my screen anymore. <laughs> Why didn't someone tell me? Let me see, let me do that. All right, so bees will get in through this slit, uh, get trapped in here and then have to emerge out the back. And when they come out, they brush against um, the uh, first the stigma and then the pollen clumps. And so that's how they're pollinated. So yeah, though these, these need um, acidic soils. So you'll often find them associated with pines or hemlocks. Um, and there are, there's even a white variety. I, I don't know if, if anyone's seen these on the plateau, but there's a pretty uncommon white, uh, white variety to them. So yeah, a great, a great flower to look for starting in late May into, into June. And trailing Arbutus was the other one. Oh yeah, um, I'm, I'm, I'm betting it's up there. Can, can anyone confirm that? Yeah, it's, um, 
I, I, I believe it needs just uh, acidic, fairly dry soils. So it, it should be, it should be there. Um, another nice showy spring flower. I don't have a slide for it, sorry. <laughs> sorry, go ahead. I just said I don't have a slide for trailing Ar Arbutus, sorry. <laughs> Seems like those are all the questions we have for now. Okay. Um, so thank you again, Chris. I can say for all of us, we really appreciate your presentation and all the questions you answered. Great. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you for the questions and thank you. Thank you for having me. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah. And again, um, if you want to contact uh, me, uh, it's cgram at ard.edu, and you can find Hudsonia online. So check us out. Thanks, everyone. Who's excited for spring wildflowers? Yay! Yeah, the warm weather, <laughs> definitely. 